Hi, I'm Nyla, and I'll be presenting on the study entitled Fermentation Behavior and Quality of Selected Cacao Genetic Groups. Uh, the trials for this study have been executed by Cocoa Research Center over four crop years, and I'll be presenting some of our findings. First of all, why was this study necessary? So there's increased emphasis on quality in the cocoa industry, and this work has implications for improving quality at the end of the value chain. And this is really encouraging quality-focused thinking and practices throughout the value chain. Since price is determined by quality, um, therefore this has tremendous potential for improving the livelihoods of farmers. Secondly, there is more diversity than initially thought. So traditionally, we think of cacao as belonging to three uh, types or three groups, Forestero, Criollo, and a naturally occurring hybrid, Trinitario. However, as of 2008, Motomayo and others have found that there's much more diversity in cacao than initially thought, with about 10 clusters. And of course, the hybrids that are produced uh, via admixing of those clusters. So there's a lot of untapped potential in terms of understanding how these uh, different groups function, what are the best fermentation protocols for them to elicit optimum quality. And thirdly, uh, prevailing uniform cocoa processing practices are something that is prevalent uh, at origin in the industry where farmers tend to use the same approaches regardless of genetics or conditions. So that is one of the other reasons why this work was so important. Again, with the why, some of the, the opportunities that exist. So ultra niche marketing. And when we say ultra niche, we refer to those uh, special small types, uh, small amounts of cocoa, which are really highly regarded and used by boutiques for producing finer chocolates and um, cocoa products. And those are increasingly in demand. Also, you have a, a change in the type of consumers. So consumers are more aware more willing to pay higher prices for things that are fairly sourced and good in quality. And then there are just more options for leveraging variability. So you have varietal branding, um, you have uh, all these programs that celebrate diversity now, such as the Cocoa of Excellence. And also uh, just, again, building on the whole notion of diversity and variety within the cocoa industry, we can look at even coffee and wine and what has been done in those industries as models for what we could now do in cocoa. But the first step is to understand what variability exists and what to do to elicit that diversity variability in terms of optimum expression of flavor profiles. So that takes us into what the objectives are and it's essentially to develop a scientific basis for varietal branding. And we did this by focusing on two areas. We want to de determine uh, whether there are distinctive attributes across the genetic groups and what do we have to do to get to elicit those attributes, to have them um, you know, optimally expressed. And today I will be giving a snapshot of diversity in terms of flavor profiles, sensory profiles, and nutraceutical potential of selected genetic groups. So into how we did it, what, what was the approach that we used? Firstly, we had to optimize a fermentation protocol because traditionally fermentations are quite large, requiring about a thousand kg in some cases in large wooden boxes. And this was, these quantities were just not available um, for this type of study. So first thing we had to do was to optimize and validate um, a small scale fermentation protocol, which was done. And having this protocol ready, we were then able to study six selected genetic clusters, Contamana, Nani, Amelinado, Iquitos Nacional, and Marignon, as well as two hybrids, Trinitario and Refractario. Um, and we were able to study fermentation behavior and quality for these types. And I just want to 
to note quickly that we understand, we do know that national is typically used to refer to cocoa um, coming out of uh, material found in Ecuador. Uh, when I say national for this study, I mean national uh, types. So these are types that were taken from Ecuador and are present in the international cocoa gene bank. And building more on that, uh, how again, where was this study conducted? So the International Cocoa Gene Bank was established in 1982. It's a consolidation of collections um, across 100 acres. It's the most diverse collection in the world. Uh, has about 2,400 accessions. Um, so this really gave us uh, an ideal environment where we could assess the genetic influences on marketable attributes of cocoa without confounding effects of the environment. So all the cocoa groups were grown on at one location and processed as well at a common location. So just going into um, briefly how we went about validating the small scale fermentation protocol. We first assessed what exists. We optimized um, out of what existed, what we thought had most potential to be a good method. And then we validated it against a large traditional fermentation in terms of sensory um, and other attributes, other quality parameters. And um, essentially we've, we have uh, advantages to this small scale fermentation protocol in that it's modular, it's low cost, well insulated, can be easily used on a farm, etc. Again, with the how we went about, so after we optimized the protocol, we actually used it to, to ferment the different groups. And during fermentation and after fermentation and drying, we monitored different parameters. So everything from temperature to pH, we did cut tests, we monitored bricks, and then after drying, we looked at different aspects like aroma volatiles, converted beans to liquors to do sensory evaluation, etc. So now into some of the results that we that we got from this study. Um, basically, when cocoa liquor made from the genetic cluster beans fermented to, for six days and dried were assessed by trained panelists and the data was used to generate the principal component analysis plot, which you're seeing now. Um, we can see clearly, so if we look, we will see that I've highlighted it. Contamana actually was associated with over-fermented notes from as early as day six of fermentation. So that already tells us that in such a case, it would be better to ferment for less time maybe four to five days. So we're already seeing that trend from um, plotting the results. Here I just did a PCA plot with the hybrids alone, Trinitario and Refractario. And of course you can also see where Trinitario by day six and day eight was associated with over fermented or putrid sensory notes. Whereas Refractario was only in that region around day eight of fermentation. So this again gives us, um, you know, a good idea about how we would ferment these two hybrids if treating them separately. Trinitario may require less fermentation than Refractario would. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't lump the two together and ferment them if you want to elicit um, optimum flavor expression or the best flavor expression. So in terms of flavor volatiles, gas chromatography, mass spectrometry was done on day six fermentation, cotyledon samples, and these samples were unroasted. Um, and for these were done for each genetic cluster. Uh, and you can see, so what I did from this was that when we, when we got the GCMS results, identifying each compound, I went into the literature, so a, an extensive literature search was done to match these compounds with the aromas that have been reported in previous studies for cacao. So the aromas were matched with what ideally, what, um, sorry, the volatiles were matched with what aromas people have found or scientists have found before. And then I did a PCA plot again to see what associations could be found. So it's, it's very interesting to see that Nani is associated with compounds 
So if you look here, nani is associated with compounds for vinegar and acidic, and whereas amelinado is associated with compounds for roasted nutty and cocoa butter, waxy, and Marignan Iquitos Nacional and Contamana had this association with sweaty, cheesy. I should also be clear that just because these compounds were detected um, via GCMS, it does not necessarily mean that uh, they could be perceived by humans during sensory evaluation. So these are just that the, the compounds were present, but it gives you an idea of what is there. And also, um, just to mention that these sweaty, cheesy, volatile compounds are likely due to the present, um, sorry, sweaty, cheesy um, aroma um, or could be likely due to the presence of the compound three methyl butanoic acid. Um, what I wanted to do here was to present the findings of volatile compounds for the hybrids in a different sort of way so you can see another way of presenting the data rather than just a PCA plot. So this is the actual chromatogram that we would get from the GCMS. So I did an overlay of the chromatograms um, and label them accordingly. So you can see the compounds present and the peaks. So um, you can see peaks for Trinitario and Refractario for day six and we found that Trinitario had the presence of 2-heptanone and 2-heptanol, whereas Refractario did not, but Refractario had ethyl acetate, which is associated with like a, a pineapple aroma. And they both would have a fruity sensory perception, but also in the case of Trinitario, there should be a floral um, sensory perception as well if you were to have a panel assess this based on the volatiles present. So this is just to show how you could have some unique volatile attributes um, as well across the genetic groups. Finally, um, just to touch on the nutraceutical potential of the groups, um, we looked at epicatechins. Of course, we also looked at catechins, caffeine, theobromine, but I'm just, I just wanted to present epicatechin as it is um, usually one of the the, I guess, antioxidant type compounds that everyone's interested in. So epicatechin is a natural plant phenol antioxidant and typically found in like green tea, chocolate, and um, it, it has, it is thought to improve cardiac efficiency. So if you can see here um, at the start of fermentation, day zero, there's a, the contamana has the highest in terms of, of epicatechins. Um, there's a general decrease, so all the groups decrease as fermentation progresses from day zero to eight. And on day eight, Nacional has the highest um, epicatechin content. So that's just to focus in on um, what was found. And this can be used to, I mean, you can, you can use this information for many different um, approaches you can take. So for one, you can find a sweet spot between where you have good epicatechin content as well as flavor and perhaps convert the beans to chocolates at that point and have something like a health, a health chocolate or a health product. Um, so you can take that spin on it as well in terms of genetic space branding. So genetic space branding does not just have to be in terms of flavor and flavor potential, but can also be in terms of nutraceuticals. So from all the information um, gleaned, what I've shown and what I've not shown, um, we were able to come up with some estimated fermentation times that would be most suitable. So you can see that this really spans a range, um, a melanado and contamana requiring the least amount of fermentation and marignan requiring the most amount of fermentation. And I should also mention that um, when we did the check on pulp quality, we found that Marignan had the lightest colored pulp, it had most pulp, it, it, and really took longer to ferment than the other types in terms of if you also look at temperature trends and pH um, trends as well. I should also mention that we started fermentation at these, we counted it as day zero, not day one. 
And um, I mean, this work is in no way are, are we advocating fixed fermentation times for the clusters, but we, we want to show that for each, each group, each uh, cluster, each hybrid, um, fermentation time may vary. There is a scientific basis for this, and that means that, that processors need to understand cues, um, fermentation cues, they need to know how to how to, when to turn, how to turn, um, what times to do different things. Um, and they need to understand that based on genetics and conditions, fermentation time will be different for these, these groups. And they can really leverage this towards genetics-based branding. So just to tie up everything together, what we did was to put all the sensory profile. So we did sort of like radar charts for each each uh, group at optimum fermentation time. So whether that was day four, day six, day eight. Um, and then we superimposed the radar charts so we could see where there are differences. Um, it's just to show that all of these groups are capable of having really good flavor and ancillary flavors if fermented properly, fermented optimally. Um, it's interesting to note that Nacional was most floral followed by Contamana and Marignan. So if you look at the, the floral um, area here, so you can see Nacional and then Contamana and Marignan. And you had some variation as well with, in terms of acidity and other things. Um, so that's just to show you that that's also something you can consider when thinking about genetics-based branding. But we are aware that just scoring doesn't give you an idea because Really and truly, there are several types of floral um, within brown fruit. There are different types of brown fruit, different types of fresh fruit. So we then went into the, the summaries that the panelists, the sensory panelists would have generated to actually pull out some key descriptor words um, so that you can see uh, deep, diving a bit deeper that there are different ways that we could actually describe floral and fruity rather than just a floral and fruity score. So you, you can see that there's really a range of flavors from Contamana being fresh yellow fruit to Refractario having more nutty, grassy notes. So in conclusion, um, there are potential differences among cacao genetic groups, and these could be exploited by fermenting in group specific ways towards genetic space branding. Of course, these have to be supported by proper monitoring protocols and management strategies in order for you to get what you want. And the results that we've obtained so far do strengthen the argument for flexible post-harvest approaches rather than a recipe book approach to fermenting. If we were to think of a way forward, I mean, there are many things we could do in terms of diving deeper into pulp quality, establishing a sensory protocol for pulp, um, doing micro microfloral profiling of fermentations, um, further profiling of genetic groups. So we've already started work on curare, but really and truly one of our main aims is to now profile on an accession level. So we've already studied at genetic group level. So we'll be moving to understanding um, accession level varietal branding. So that's next up. And lastly, we just like to acknowledge the following persons and institutions for their invaluable support. Thank you.